What's up, guys? I'm Jeff. I'm Melissa. And welcome back to the Real Life Podcast. We have a special episode for you today. Well, first of all, thanks for being back with us the last two weeks, or three weeks, actually. So two weeks ago, we did some reruns. People really loved those, the Motherhood one and the Sally Clarkson interview. Last week, I believe, or a couple weeks ago, we did Jeremy Pryor's interview I did with him. Guys, as always, go check out 5-Minute Fatherhood daily podcast that we just started. Go check out Dad's Building Teams weekly podcast we just started immense value there. We put a lot into those projects. We hope they're going to bless you and encourage you. We're also doing lots of giveaways you'll see on social media. So make sure to subscribe to the 5-Minute Fatherhood YouTube channel because we do all videos of that too. 5-Minute Fatherhood podcast and Dad's Building Teams podcast. If you do all three of those and send us screenshots, we're actually randomly picking messages and uh, giving people fun prizes. I think we what had are a, the prizes? I think we had like an Amazon tap, an Echo, uh, some other things, some of our family team stuff. It's just kind of we're kind of just um, I giving mean, who away everything. Like free stuff, right? Exactly. So make sure yeah. to do that. Okay, guys, we're gonna jump right into it. Wait, then, wait, can I say something first? Oh, well, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> it was just so funny. I was like, Jeff, what are we gonna talk about today? He's like, Oh, you know, well, you already know, eschatological. I can't even say it. Eschatological realism. Da, 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 da. I'm like, actually, I don't know anything. So this will be a fun, <laughs> a well, fun podcast. It will, well, you do know, but it's just a funny, fancy, big word. And the reason we want to do this episode. Wait, how do you say it? Eschatological. Eschatological. Realism. Realism. Okay. So you guys have heard that phrase if you listen to the podcast because that's in the intro. I say like sometimes oh, we'll talk. I think I say like true. I think I say we'll talk about kids and potty training and eschatolo- like eschatological realism. Like I t- talk about kind of we'll talk about everything. And so I thought it'd be a fun episode <laughs> to actually do it on that because I just threw that word out when I was recording the intro that day. Um, but we've never actually done an episode on it. So here is the episode. Now that's a fancy term. Eschatological for those who don't know kind of means depends on how you interpret it, but can kind of mean end times. But don't think like Armageddon, like all that end times, just like the end. Left behind. Yeah, just at the end of time like the final chapter the final countdown (laughs) so good um or it can mean um kind of the ultimate destiny kind of like what the picture looks like at the end when it's all kind of put back together and then realism obviously can have a couple different definitions as well but when those are put together eschatological realism in christian theology it can mean a few things but the one i want to center on that i think is kind of what mainly i see it used and talked about is the truth and the mind blowing truth of the gospel and of the good news of Jesus, which is that the reality that will be true at the end eschatologically, meaning that we'll be fully glorified in Christ, we'll be fully one with him, we'll be fully realized, kind of that realism, we'll be fully realized as our true selves with no sin, fully beloved, fully glorified, all these different things. There's an aspect and a level at which that is true now. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the the theological truth that is really, really special to Christianity. That's really, really special to following Jesus. And what that means is your future self is already in some sense true right now in Christ, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Meaning like all that you will ever be in a fully glorified, beautiful, amazing way, there is a level at which that is already not even just true now, but like it's an actual reality in the heavenly places, right? It says you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Um, and you are, you know, united one with him. So whatever is already true. So like what's true of Christ, which that he is glorified in a resurrected body fully, you know, um, before the father, full access, basically all these benefits and all these truths about what you, what we're looking forward to in the future, which we know at some sense is not true yet, but in some sense, the scripture says is true right now. And this is deeply important, I think, because it's an actual mind blowing truth that like we, that the, our job as Christians is not to try to get to some future that's unattainable that we have to do a bunch of works for that we just have to kind of sweat more and wring our hands more and work harder for our job as Christians is to actually pull the future into the present. So our job is to kind of throw the lasso into the future and say, no, I'm going to make that true right now, or I'm going to live in that as if that's true right now. Kind of like how when Jesus said, or when God, the father said over Jesus during his baptism, you are the beloved um, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus had done nothing yet. He hadn't done any accomplished anything. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't gone to the resurrection. He hadn't even done any of his healings. Like that was the beginning of him, mm-hmm. of his kind of ministry. But yet he's fully beloved, right? And I, and, and living, and Jonathan Martin is a, a author I enjoy. In one of his books, he said, the scandalous thing about Jesus is when God said he was the beloved, Jesus was the only person in human history who actually believed him. Mm-hmm. Like the, like that's what made Jesus, Jesus is he wow. actually fully believed that he was beloved, meaning like fully 
realize and in access mm-hmm. to Jesus and in access to the Father. So we can keep unpacking this a little bit more and there's a lot more there and I don't want to confuse people, but essentially that's one of the mind blowing theological truths of the Christian gospel is that there is an aspect of future blessing and benefit that the Christian scriptures and traditions say we currently have access to now. And I think this matters because then you're, like I said, your job is to not to try to work to some future that maybe is unattainable or you don't even know if you're going to get, your job is to actually just live into who you already are. Every sin, that's what I'm, that's more what I'm trying to say. It took me a second to get there. But <laughs> every sin, every frailty, every part of you that is more from the curse, that is broken shalom, that is fractured from Genesis 3, all of that is actually coming from a deep place of you not living into who you truly are. Mm. Meaning like who you, tr- like that's actually the, Christians, and the other big word for that is sanctification, meaning the process of growth and holiness and walking with Jesus, is sanctification is essentially just living in who you already are. And I know that's kind of like weird and sounds contradictory, but you have any thoughts there? Wait, sanctification is living in who we already are? Well, sanctification is like the growth process, but I think the aspect of it that makes it the growth is every time you're growing, you're essentially just kind of stepping more and more into who you already Mm, are. That's so good. Does that make sense? Yeah, I've never heard that before. Yeah, and I think that is really mind-blowing because to me that takes off pressure, mm-hmm. that takes off shame, that takes off guilt, and that feels more like it's... And again, and you see this thread in Scripture, like when it says in Hebrews, strive to enter the rest of God, I think that's another level. Like there is a level at which you have to strive to do nothing. There's a level at which you have to strive to be in, to abide. Yeah. Yeah. You have to strive totally. to you have to strive to abide. Mm-hmm. And again, that's really unique to Christian the Christian gospel is we're striving. Like it does take work. It does take mm-hmm. sweat, equity in the heart. But it's almost because we're so up in an upside down, you know, stranger things, cursed world. Mm-hmm. So we, it actually you have to strive just to get back to the right side up. And the right side up is you are, are you are already fully realized in Christ. And that's the Christian gospel. And there's a level, of course, of the kingdom of, you know, in the future, but not yet. Um, or I mean, in, in the present, but not yet fully realized. And so that clash of kind of the two the timeline that the, the, that that's what's really interesting about the Christian gospel is it totally uprooted actually the current thinking of the day which Jews in the first century very much believed similar to what we believe that there will be a time in the future where God fully judges the nations and people and brings everyone back into blessing and brings everyone back into the rights and and restores everything but Jesus did this weird thing where him and then obviously through theology we see that Paul starts teaching and preaching it, it, it became this really weird like Venn diagram overlap that was not, no one saw it like that before, right? It was very much like the present age and the age to come, right? Yeah. That was actually the phrases they used in the first century, the present age and the age to come. Now, what's interesting about Christianity and Jesus and the gospel is that it blended those two, it overlapped mm. those two, hmm. meaning like, yes, there is an age to come, but that age to come is invading this current age. Hmm. And that's why, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's like an invasion happening and that's kind of like it's like a slow it's like a venn diagram that slowly is merging into one circle Hmm. does that make sense yeah any thoughts i mean my mind is getting blown anybody else (laughs) um i think it's really i mean i feel like i've heard these things before but it's kind of on a deeper level that you're taking us to but i love just when we talked about um, you know, our, our community group this last fall went through yeah, and identity related, yeah. and who we are and um, learning to just really live in who God has made you to be. But I think there's this beautiful picture that we are becoming who we already are. Yeah. So when we become, when we're created and when Jesus, when we come to salvation, you know, it says that we have every blessing in Christ, Ephesians 1 or Ephesians 3. What? We have every blessing in Christ. Yeah, Ephesians 1. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly Um, places. And so, and like when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And so we have all the gifts. We have like, we are righteous. We are holy. We are pure. But it's like we're learning to live in that. And we're learning, just like what you said, sanctification. We're learning to put off the flesh, put off the things that aren't of the Lord, put off selfishness and all those things and become... um, more and more like Jesus. But it's so, I think it's such a beautiful, freeing, beautiful picture when we already know that we already are called all these things. We're declared these things. God sees us as these things. And so we're just learning to live in it. Yeah, because that's the the freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Of stepping into what you already are. Mm-hmm. And there, there is a level, of course, there's a tension there of like, well, yeah, but that's not totally true. Like I'm still sinful. I'm still broken. I'm still hurt. And yes, but that's that 
paradox, for lack of a better term, that is the the heaven. Like, do you actually believe that heaven's reality is more true than what you feel right now and what you think? Right. Yeah. And it's and we we can hear Lucy crying too. So if if you have to pop out or whatever, that's fine. I'll just okay. keep talking. Um. But that's actually something you have to deeply wrestle with, guys. Is do you believe? That there's a that the truest reality is actually God's dimension, mm-hmm. right? Which is kind of like scripturally heaven, yeah. right? And not heaven with babies and harps and floating w- wings and all that stuff. <laughs> heaven in the sense of like God's throne room dimension headquarters. What's that scene in Hunger Games where it's like a the game maker or whatever in that room where he's making all the screens? But like that that's kind of the 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 nerve center. There's an actual reality that's true there that we don't feel here on earth as much, even though it is true, right? Mm-hmm. Like we are like we are already, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are already seated at the right hand of God. We are, um, you know, uh, uh, we are, our life is hidden with Christ in God. Mm-hmm. I think that's either Ephesians or uh, Colossians. Um, so there's, there's realities that have taken place in the heavenly places mm-hmm. that like don't feel true right now. So yeah. then the question we have to really ask is, do you really believe that there is a true reality than your five senses. Not one that's like a fake reality and not one that's like an imaginary reality. Just do you believe that there's actually realms and dimensions that are truer? Because that's what the scripture is saying, that there is a realm, there is places, and there is God on high enacting and saying certain truths that are just more true. Like it's almost like we're... And that's why I think it makes sense then when you start reading a scripture where it says, we have our eyes veiled, we are blinded, Mm. we are you know, it's our sin is corroding our hearts and we are, you know, led astray. Like there's a level at which like, and and uh, even Paul says what we, we look through a glass or whatever dimly, like, or it's faded or it's foggy. Like there is a level at which we actually don't see true reality. Hmm. And, and, and the Christian walk is actually a life of trying to step into true reality, hmm. which is again, like what's, what's emanating from God's throne. And so, yeah. So I just think this, this is such a huge, important concept that I think a lot of us have to really wrestle with because you have to actually ponder and think if you're in Christ, if you've trusted Christ, if you followed him, if you love Jesus, if you understood grace and you've repented and your life has been transformed, you like, there is a level at which your future self, you're like, you have to rip that into the present and say, yes, I am these things already in Christ, not in any of your own skill or not in of your own attainment or ambition. But you have to kind of rip those into the future and that, I mean, rip those in the, from the future into the present. And so like, and so it's, and that's another way to put it too, is like Jonathan Martin. I love how he says this too with Jesus. He says, what was crazy about Jesus is Jesus was almost like a person from the future. Mm. Like he, he, he was basically coming like what it was going to be like in the age to come. Jesus said, I'm going to like, like pull the fabric open and step into the present with that. And he did, he did. He ripped, he brought the future reality of what God's restored full kingdom is going to be like, where we're reigning and ruling alongside him in intimacy with him. And he said, and he boom, brought that into, you know, three AD or whatever you believe Jesus actually was born. It wasn't zero. I don't think, but that's a whole nother conversation. (laughs) Um, So, so okay, Kim, let's bring this. So this is like super high level, 30,000 feet up. Can we bring it down to ground level? Like how does this affect our day to day? I I think I already, already said that. (laughs) This is, this is the difference between Jeff and I. Um, He's like, I already said that. It's practical. Just, you know, and I'm like, let's get down to the nitty gritties. How can this affect us? Because I think the thing is, oftentimes, if we think about it, we don't live in that reality. Yeah. And I think what you were saying about abiding in Christ, striving for abiding or whatever, like mm-hmm. that stuff is active. We can't just, you know, God talks about in John 15, yeah. abiding in Christ, remaining in him. Um, all these things, it's not like we just sit here and do nothing. It's like we have to actively train our mind to be with him, to be quiet, to be still, to talk with him, to let his truth reign in our mind instead of our thoughts or these, um, or letting our mind spiral. Or so often I think we can just start to, these little lies creep in and they start to take over. And so I think, you know, when God talks, Jesus talks so much about truth. If you go through the gospels, there's so yeah. like, truth is probably repeated so many times. Totally. And I'm realizing it over, I'm realizing it lately that it's so important to be in the word and to be in the spirit and to let our minds dwell on what is true so that we can put off what is false. And mm. and so I think you know, abiding in Christ and letting your mind really think like, I am the beloved. I am 
holy. I am righteous. I am strong. I am enough. Like the Lord is enough. He works through me. All these truths. I think that is part of living in our identity. Yeah. And that's why I think even like when there's not, there's not just so much stuff in the New Testament about truth. There's so much stuff in the New Testament about lies Mm -hmm. and that Satan, you know, or Satan in Hebrew just (laughs) means the accuser. Um, That's his main. Yeah. I think we also use Satan as like a, yeah, that's not his first name. Like it's not like John Smith and it's Satan. It's like, that just means the accuser, Mm. the accusing one. He actually doesn't have a name. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Um, And so the, the, like that's literally his actual like Satan Hebrew accuser literally is like his his identity is actually based around accusing and lying Mm -hmm. um it's so fundamental to who he is and it's so fundamental to what he does and it's so sly sly and 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 but what's interesting is then again so i think when you're when you're sinning right or when you're which by the way again sin in greek that word literally means to miss the mark i think sometimes Mm -hmm. we think like sin is this bad behavior or more whatever no sin in the greek the word literally means like almost like an arrow in a bullseye, like archery. It almost means to miss the bullseye. So it means like you you missed genuine humanness. Like when you sinned, you were you you were you were living a lie. Like then that's that's the truth. Mm. If you you genuine humanness is the bullseye, and we're supposed to live in the bullseye of like gen, like what it means to be fully human. Mm. That's to to flourish and to not live in sin. Now obviously we can't since the curse and the fall and sin and all that. So we miss the mark. But what's interesting about that is then it has to, like it's inherently sin is really about lying. Like when you sin, you're lying. Mm-hmm. You're, 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 li- you're living in a lie that that's not the true reality mm-hmm. of what it means to be human. I'm just, you're going to pop out. Yeah. You can, you can, yeah, it's a real life podcast. You can say, guys, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, guys, I'll be right back. I'll get loose. Um, and so I think, uh, and while she gets her guys, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. So I think sin, you have to really understand it with that picture that sin is missing the mark and that mi- it's not, I think we sometimes sin is moral. I'm not saying we moralize sin um, too much, but there, I hope you guys hear what I'm saying. There's a level at which we don't think about it like that. We don't think about it missing the mark of genuine humanness. That's literally the actual definition from the Greek missing the mark of genuine humanness as proper, faithful, fulfilling image bearers. Um, it's almost like image bearers is meant to bear an image. And we're almost more like broken mirrors where we can't, we can't bear the image anymore. We can't, we're cracked, we're broken, we're fractured. And again, Oh, that, that's a perfect analogy. So the mirror, like if you look in a broken mirror, it tells a lie. It's not a represent. It's not a true representation. So if you look in the mirror, it's it's a lie. And I think that has to do then with truth, and then also this eschatological realism idea of like there is a level at which truly true sometimes doesn't feel like it because we're in such a cursed world that bases its fundamental DNA and molecules and air we breathe on lies, and so. I think you just have to really deal with that. So, and what, so then, yeah, to bring this down to the ground, what this really means is when you are sinning or when you're struggling or when you're just walking with the Lord in your day-to-day basis, you have to constantly recalibrate and recenter yourself towards that true north. And that true north is your fully glorified, realized self. And this plays out in marriage really well, too, because I think me and you have talked about this a lot in marriage when you treat me like my future self, right. I step into that. Mm-hmm. Does that makes sense. So like when Alyssa, it's like speaking. Yeah. It's like speak, speaking words are like li- that too. Speaking life over. Yeah. Somebody. By the way, like you, you can get down to the theology of words. It's not a coincidence that words actually can fully like create a future for someone, mm-hmm. right? Like God, God's word created the future, created the world, created the, you know, the seven day rhythm, the everything. It's, it was a word, like his word, his very essence is logos. And so humans have that same capacity, obviously not in the God way, but as image bearers, we have the reflection of that. And that is that we can actually create people's futures and destinies in some sense for them to step into. Like we can open doors that kind of, and we push people in. That's another way to put it. And we also, our words can also devastate people. Well, I mean, yeah, and truth bring and them into, um, well, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying both. Yeah. Yeah. Both, like definitely. you can open a door, you can a open a door. Power. You can open a door and shove someone into it mm-hmm. with a truth or a lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, you know, you can say like, and everyone knows this. If you were raised and for 10 years, you just heard you're terrible, you're not good enough, you're blah. Then of course, when you're 25 years old, all you're going to think about your true reality is that you're terrible, you're not good mm-hmm. enough. But if you open the door and push someone in a door that's, you're kind, you're gentle, I appreciate you, you're creative, you're amazing, you lead well. Then you actually, what's weird is this is the weird paradox. You actually start becoming that. Yeah. You weren't that. Like that's, so it's like when a marriage, right? Like 
Alyssa, like, I'm not kind. I'm not that gentle. I'm not whatever. I'm not maybe that good of a leader. And Alyssa will say, you know, oh, you're such a good leader. You're so kind. You're so gentle. All these things. And what I notice is then when she's doing that rhythmically, I step into that reality. But there's also a level at which her words created that reality mm-hmm. for me yeah. or that future for me. Mm-hmm. It's a perfect metaphor for like Christ. Mm-hmm. Of like he sets and opens these doors and creates and speaks our futures that we step into. Yeah. And then when we actually do it, we actually start becoming that. And here's another way to put it. Your current self to your future self, there's a gap, right, of what you feel like you are now to what you will be. Now, stepping into your future self and living in Christ's truth kind of is this way of closing that gap more and more and more. That's essentially what you're trying to do is you say, no, 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 I'm going to bring that future self closer to this current self. I'm going to bring this current self closer to this future self. Uh, uh, Lucy's contributing. Lucy's laughing. She's so excited to be on the podcast. Are you laughing? She's so sweet. She's okay, so I will. Okay, so I want to just add this too in our um, small group. And this I was gonna, last yeah, I was going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the scripture has so many things about who we are. Like we are, and things I've already mentioned. We're the beloved. We're righteous. We're pure. Um, you know, I think of First Peter where it talks about we're high priests and all these beautiful truths over us. But also, there's an aspect. And yeah, I, don't, I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast yet. But we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit yeah. speaks to us, and we can ask Him. Like, have you ever asked him, Lord Jesus, who am I? Who do you mm-hmm. say, who do you say that I am? Because I believe that he has not only given us all those identities, but he also has specific identities over each person. Yeah. Like you are whatever. You are a pillar of strength. You are, um, oh man, what are the ones? Just so many cool things. You mm-hmm. are a bridge builder. You are a peacemaker. You are um, beloved. You are a welcomer. All these beautiful truths that I believe he has for each one of us. And he might have one for you. He might have mm-hmm. 10 for you. And so um, we did this in our Ohana, and which is our small group. And it was so cool. I don't know. I guess I just had never like asked Jesus who I am. I always went to scripture, which we go to scripture, of course, but also asking the Holy Spirit, who am I? Who do you think that I am? What calling have you given me? What purpose do I have? Um, And asking him that and then believing him. And I think sometimes, you know, it's the very first thing that comes to our mind. And a lot of times we push that away because we're like, no, we're not that. Like, no, Lord, I'm not that. Totally. Because we know all of our weaknesses too. But to, instead of pushing that away, just being like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write that down. And if you need confirmation, then ask the Lord, Lord, will you confirm that in me? Will you speak that over me? Help me to have faith to believe. And I think he really does speak to us. And for me, I don't feel like the Lord told me things specifically, but then he would speak through a, um, a couple of my friends of words that he had given me. And I think it's just those things. It's like, we see a glimpse of it, but we see our weaknesses and we're like, no, we can't be that. But then believing those and having those truths over us so we can start to live in them because they are true of us, but it's it's like that speaking life over us and really walking in it. And, um, for me, a couple of the things that the people spoke over me this last fall was that I am a hope giver Okay, you don't have to clap. You don't have to clap. It's true. And that I am Mary at the feet of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so I've just been really sitting in that this last six months or so and really asking the Lord. Um, I don't know. They've just been really like a blanket of comfort for me. Yeah. And it's kind of given me direction. And it's also given me hope because the funny thing is I, so this is me being very candid with everybody. Um, I really, I, I don't know if I've shared this before, but. You know, oh, at least like with three. Me? With well, with no, me? no, no, no. On the podcast. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. At least three times a week, I'll wake up in the morning feeling very anxious and very fearful and just down. And it's just, I'm trying to figure it out and really like seek the Lord about it. But a lot of the times I don't feel full of hope. And so it's very interesting to me that the Lord has spoken over me that I am a hope giver. And so just to me that brings so much comfort. Like the Lord is still using me to bring hope to people and my family, even though often I really struggle to have hope in my day to day. Um, I don't think it's coincidence either that when our struggles in our day to day is usually because that's where we're most gifted or most able to minister. So I don't think that's coincidence that Satan purposely usually attacks the places Mm -hmm. and feeds us the lies of almost the exact place of where we need, where we're called to speak truth in our vocation. It's really interesting. And so anyway, I just, wanted to share that to maybe be an encouragement because to me, I had never like even asked the spirit, who am I? Mm. And so I just want to encourage you if you're listening today to ask him, 
And the Lord speaks to us, you know, yeah. over and over. He says, just ask me, ask me, ask me. And he will speak to us in ways that probably are different than what we're expecting. Totally. And I think let's end with this. Well, I want to come back to that and even double harp on that. We end with that exercise, but let's end with this thought. Cause I love what you said about the Holy spirit. And I think that made me give me a thought that's so true and talk about what you're saying that will hopefully make this kind of really feel like put together and understandable and give it another layer. So it's not, it's not a coincidence that the language in the new Testament is that we are anointed with the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's not a coincidence that in Ephesians, all these places that actually tell about these crazy, like uh, Ephesians is the most cosmic high level. Like this is who you truly are in Christ. It's Mm -hmm. crazy book of like kind of, it's almost like seeing us through God's perspective. The first three chapters is like that true reality glasses of like, Oh, this is the true reality. It's crazy book and it's amazing book. Um, but it's not a coincidence that it's the craziest high level, like eschatological realistic book. Yet it's also the book that has a lot about the Holy spirit. Specifically, it says that the Holy spirit is the seal or the sign or that stamp or seal of our inheritance. And meaning there's a level at which we get sealed immediately upon faith, um, in Christ. And we immediately have the indwelling spirit of Christ where he's fully reigning and ruling in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that seal is like royal language, right? Or anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's royal language. And why that's interesting is because I think I think the metaphor really helps to stay in the royal. We, we, we don't get a lot of these things because we don't have any royal tones in our culture. Yeah. When the New Testament and the Old Testament certainly did. So take... So I'm like sniffly today. Um, <laughs> take... take uh, Kate and... Well, no, yeah, we'll in the sec. Oh, I'm at okay. Old Testament. So like, uh, you stole my thunder, actually. I was going to go there. Um, I'm like no, so excited to go there because I, know, no. I so, think we all love royalty. I know, yeah. So Old Testament, okay, guys, there's a, this happened over and over again. David's probably the most classic example where David was called by God and stepped into that reality and was anointed as king. This is what people, people a lot, sometimes a lot of people don't realize is about the story. Like he was anointed as king, meaning like a divine crazy moment of like, you are going to be king or you are king, like royalty anointing um, over him. I think right after Goliath, I might have to open up this, uh, that story or right before maybe. No, yeah, right after. But what's crazy is he didn't become king till a lot later. That's what I'm trying to say. He didn't actually sit his butt on a throne and reign and rule over Israel a lot later after the anointing. But the anointing was the sure sign and seal that he would reign and rule in the future. It wasn't a gamble. It wasn't a maybe. It was a God had picked him and anointed him with oil. And that, and that, that's a perfect example of that. Like, uh, yes, but not yet. Or like Mm. here, but not fully yet. Or like, of like he was anointed King. It was reality. He's King. Like he's King. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't in the role fully yet reigning and ruling. Mm. And I think that's a really good picture of like, like we've been anointed, we've been sealed, we've been signed with the Holy spirit as our, as our deliver, as our sign or symbol of an inheritance or of an anointing, which is why it says the anointing of the Holy spirit. Um, as like we are, the royal stamp has been put on us and we can live as if that's true. Once you have the royal decree on you, you can actually live in that reality. Like you have a, you have a different authority immediately, even though you're not fully reigning and ruling on the throne. That makes sense. Like you are royal the minute you get anointed mm. because you're anointed to be king. You're, you're in that line now. You're yeah. in that succession. And it's not a coincidence either, by the way, that all those words with Jesus are the same thing. I think it's what, what's in Hebrew, like Meshiach or Meshach is Messiah. Then you translate that in Greek from the Septuagint, and that's what we get the word Christ. And Christ in Greek literally translates as the anointed one. Mm-hmm. So it's like he was the one that was anointed to reign and rule over the nations and put the world back to rights. But we, but that clearly, that fully hasn't happened yet. But yet it also in the moment of the cross was when he was put on the throne in one aspect. So it's like that, I think the anointing and the royal language is really helpful to be able to juggle both the realities of like every benefit and truth is true right now. Mm -hmm. Yet there's still an extra level that has to happen. And yeah, Kate or Megan and uh, uh, Charles, why am I blanking? William William and Charles. Is it Megan and Charles? Prince Charles? No, no, that's the the dad. Uh, Why are we blanking? I know. It's like (laughs) Harry. Harry. Thank you. (laughs) Megan and Harry. Um, Okay. We just shamed ourselves in front of everyone. No, no. They're they're not like the reigning monarch, Mm -mm. but they're royal and they're in line. Now, actually, if you actually know your details, I think he's like seventh in line. So he probably will never be. But I'm just saying like. Prince William. Yeah. It's like third or something. But so uh, that's really, I'm just saying that's a really good example of like, that's one of the last vestiges of us being able to kind of understand or interpret like anointing or royalty or in line of succession of benefits while still having those benefits now. So 
And with I, that, are we done? Well, actually, yeah, I literally was going to wrap up. So I think Lucy's letting us know. But guys, oh, sorry, that was a guys. lot in this episode. Real life. And we could have gone more, but I thought because it was a denser one, we would keep it to the 30 minutes instead of the 40, 45. We go sometimes with longer ones. So we love you guys. We hope you have a good day. Hey, end with this exercise. Ask the Lord who you are. If yeah. you've never actually had a moment, it doesn't have to be the heavens don't have to open up. It doesn't have to be some Old Testament audible <laughs> voice, but through a story, a dream, a passage, a scripture, a friend telling you. Yeah. Um, and it might take a, a couple weeks. Yeah, take, or months or so years just keep or layers. Just like, have you actually ever asked and pursued that question? Or are you scared to pursue that question um, of who the Lord says you are? Because he has an answer for you. And when you get that, then you can have that true north to constantly calibrate and pursue and point yourself towards because it's already true in Christ. So we love you guys and we'll see you next week. Bye.